Welcome everyone for Commission Together from Home. We would have loved to be together in Mumbai for a conference. However, the current situation does not allow us to do that. So therefore we choose this method of connecting with everyone. It is really a joyous occasion for Julie and I to come to you this way. This conference is planned for three days, today, tomorrow and day after. And I'm really praying and believing God will meet with every one of us. So I'm going to ask Julie to actually just greet you and then she got something to share from the scripture. Welcome everybody. The theme of this conference is Press On. So I would like to read from Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Press on, that's the theme. That's the theme for this conference. We have really uh, much to celebrate for what God has done. You will hear and see that shortly. But we want to really thank God and we really want to commit these three days into God's hands. So I'm going to pray first. Yeah. Father, we thank you for just gathering us together. Yes. People from different nations, from their homes. And Lord, we pray today each one will meet with you in a very special way. Not only meeting with you, O oh God, I pray these times they will be encouraged to press on. The days ahead are challenging, but I pray that everyone will press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of us. So thank you, Father, and be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we worship, Let's hear greetings from different people from our Commission family. Jirat se aap sabhi ko namaste. Khurja Bulan Sahir, UP ki taraf se aap sab ko salam. Hi, I'm Sydney. And I'm Sharil. Welcome. From Mumbai, India. Hum dono log milkar khabur Uttar Pradesh se कमीशन परिवार का स्वागत करते हैं हम मैं अपने जीवन में कमीशन परिवार का स्वागत करता हूं नासिक इंडिया मधुन सर्वना ख्रिस्ता मधे सलाम हम दोनों लोग हर दोनों तरफ देश से कमीशन परिवार का स्वागत करते हैं धन्यवाद मैं विजेंद्र कुमार निगम में मैं फरुखाबाद उत्तर प्रदेश में रहकर प्रभु की सेवा करता हूं इस द लॉर्ड मेरा नाम देवेश कुमार है मेरी वाइफ मेरा नाम रजनी है हम लोग उत्तर प्रदेश फरुखाबाद से हैं हेलो ग्रीटिंग्स फ्रॉम पोखरा नेपाल मैं जिला हरदोई उत्तर प्रदेश से हूं और मैं कमीशन परिवार का स्वागत करता हूं। वेलकम टू कमीशन टुगेदर। मेरा नाम पाइटर हरीश कुमार है मैं सेवा करता हूं दोनों मिलकर के और कमीशन परिवार का दोनों हम स्वागत करता हूं। हाय, ग्रीटिंग्स फ्रॉम वेलकम इंडिया मैं एक साथ मिलकर कमीशन परिवार का स्वागत करता हूँ जय मसी की मेरा नाम चांदनी है और हम कमीशन परिवार का स्वागत करते हैं जय मसी की और हम दोनों मिलते कमीशन परिवार का हरदोई में स्वागत करते हैं। नमस्कार वेलकम टू कमीशन वेलकम टू कमीशन हाय, दिस इज उषा डेविड फ्रॉम कारवार कर्नाटका मुझे प्रवास सारणपुर यूपी से आप सबको जय मसी फ्रॉम चूरा नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडिया आप सबको सलाम जय मसी कभी सुबह के नाम में आप सबको जय मसी की मुंबई से आप सभी को सलाम हेलो जय मसी की मेरा नाम मिथुन कुमार है हेलो आई एम कैलाश फ्रॉम मालवाड़ी 
वेलकम टू कमीशन टुगेदर हेलो कमीशन टुगेदर में आप सभी का स्वागत है Wow that was such a an awesome time of worship you could feel the presence of god yeah. it's so good to see all churches coming together absolutely. like this absolutely absolutely right thank you thank you everyone for serving us so well here is another exciting news 5 years ago we were praying and believing god for 200 churches by 2020 and julie god has really blessed the commission family with that we are now well over 200 churches 219 she is very happy <laughs> i think uh, uh, you know one of when we thought about uh, this conference theme yes we have arrived to certain level but we don't want to remain here we want to believe god for 
the next 10 years, God will really bless us with a thousand churches. I know it's a big thing, but you know what? When we even believed God for 200 churches, it was a step of faith. And with uh, prayer and a lot of sincere hard work from many people. So I want to say thank you so much. Thank you for your faith in us. Thank you for your prayers. And thank you so much for your generosity. So God bless you. But we have this great dream to believe God for thousand churches in the next 10 years. Amen. 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 All right. We also have a video just to show a glimpse of what happened in the last few years. Let's watch the video. Our goal was to reach 200 churches before the year 2020 ended. At last year's conference, we had reported 99 commission churches. This year, we are so thrilled to report that we are well over 200 commission churches. Hallelujah. Praise God. I do want to commend the churches and also the SEND team for really taking on this goal and working hard towards seeing this accomplished. We would have loved to have celebrated this in a physical space, but because we are unable to do so, we gathered with these uh, new leaders who joined the Commission family on the 5th of November, where we had a wonderful time of praying and sharing with one another. In a short while, we're going to hear from some of these key leaders that have joined us. Do listen in. God bless. I'm Robinson Kazmir, Kathmandu. When I can family से बना सकता हूँ तो मैं मंडली अच्छी तरह से बना सकूँगा जॉन ब्रदर और सिडनी ब्रदर से मिला तब मुझे बहुत कुछ सीखने को मिला जो कमीशंस का एम से जो जो चर्च स्थापना हो स्टाबलिश करना ये सब हम लोग मिलकर कर सकते हैं एम सुशांत विश्वास फ्रॉम बांग्लादेश आई एम वेरी ग्लैड एंड वेरी प्राउड to have a part of commission family. I saw the helping attitude of commission uh, that has positively impacted me. Last year, the apostolic leaders uh, came to Bangladesh uh, to train our leaders. It was a very effective effort and it was really fruitful for our leaders. We have 12 churches and uh, many fellowship here. Greetings to you, name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am Dennis Sharkar from Bangladesh. I am very happy to be a part of Commission family. One thing that has positively impacted me about the Commission family that they regularly arrange the training program for our Bangladeshi leaders. Uh, praise the Lord, my Pastor Simon. I am a commission of the leaders and family members. I am a member of the leaders and the family members. I am a member of the leaders and the family members. I am a member of the leaders and the family members. I am a member of the leaders and the family members. I am a member of the leaders and the family members. I am a member of the leaders and the में आगे बढ़े कैसे जैसे सेवा में आगे आगे बढ़े कैसे हम कलिशिया स्थापना करने में आगे बढ़े मेरा नाम विवेश कुमार है और मैं बिहार राज्य से हूं और ये मेरी पत्नी स्मिता कुमारी है बिहार और झारखंड की कलिशिया एवं सहकर्मी को ओर से आप सबको जय मसीह की मैं कमीशन परिवार के साथ मिलकर हां सेवा करना चाहता हूं क्योंकि मैंने कमीशन परिवार में मैंने परमेश्वर में समर्पित परमेश्वर का महान दास पास्टर रंजित एवं कमीशन परिवार को बाइबल की सच्चाई के आधार पर अगुवाई करने वाले पास्टर बिनु को पाया जो दर्शन उन्होंने भारत एवं अन्य देशों के हर कोने में परमेश्वर की कलिसे स्थापना करने की बोझ लिया है इस महान कार्य से मैं बहुत ही प्रभावित हूँ। सभी को जय मसीह की मैं योगेश लाल मेरठ उत्तर प्रदेश से और मैं प्रभु को धन्यवाद करता हूँ कि उन्होंने मुझे कमीशन टीम के साथ सेवा करने का 
अवसर दिया इसके लिए प्रभु को धन्यवाद करता हूँ जो मैंने देखा उनका मसीह यीशु में प्रेम जो भाईचारे का प्रेम है वो उनके जीवन से प्रकट होता है और वो हमें अच्छा लगा है और हमने ये महसूस किया कि हम साथ मिलकर एक और बड़े क्षेत्र में और बड़े एरिया में हम लोग कार्य करने पाएंगे मैं पास्टर जयपाल सिंह फ्रॉम स्टेट यूपी खुर्जा से मैं वास्तव में परमेश्वर का धन्यवाद करता हूँ कि इन दिनों में हम कमीशन के साथ बहुत कुछ सीख रहे हैं हमारी टीम एक्साइटेड है परमेश्वर का धन्यवाद मैं यही कहना चाहूँगा कि हम इस प्रदेश में हम मिलकर परमेश्वर के राज्य की बढ़ोतरी के लिए कांधे से कांधे मिलाकर हम सेवा कर सकें मधु मीठे नाम में आप सभी को जय मसीह की मैं संजीव लाल और और गुरु ने अवसर दिया कि एक बड़े बड़े ग्लोबल एक संस्था के संग कमीशन परिवार के संग जुड़ने का प्रोविशन ने अवसर प्रदान किया कि हम जो यूपी के छोटे से क्षेत्र में सेवा कर रहे थे लेकिन अब हम कमीशन के संग मिलकर यूपी के क्षेत्र में सेवा कर रहे हैं जिसके जरिए हम परमेश्वर के राज्य को इस यूपी के हर एक गाँव हर एक शहर हर एक मोहल्ले तक पहुँचाने में मैं अमित कुमार सहारनपुर यूपी से हम परमेश्वर का धन्यवाद करते हैं कमीशन चर्च के इस प्यार के लिए जो हमने उनके बीच में मसीह के नाम में पाया और इस परिवार के साथ जुड़ते हुए में बड़ा आनंद महसूस हो रहा है क्योंकि सच में हम एक साथ मिलकर एक साथ चलकर परमेश्वर की देह को जो कलीसिया है उसकी उसकी प्रगति के लिए आगे बढ़ेंगे what an exciting times that we are living in when we plan for this conference to be in mumbai because of the nature of the conference 200 churches by 2020 we wanted two people to be present at this conference terry vogo who's been the father of new frontiers really helped us to in so many years and then guy in the last maybe over a decade has been closely working with us and we wanted both terry and wendy and guy and heather but again the situation doesn't allow them to be together with us in person but i've asked terry to actually bring a short encouragement to this gathering so it is always a joy and a privilege actually to hear terry speak someone says it vintage virgo so it is both julie and i it's it's our real privilege to welcome terry to bring a word of encouragement to us over to you terry Hello everybody. Wendy and I were looking forward so much to being with you at your November conference, but hey, we can't be there in person, but it's a joy to be with you online, and I do pray that God will speak to you through what I had to share with you. I was so blessed seeing so many of you on our global meeting recently with sending greetings from all over India. That was such a blessing, such a joy. So here's the word of the Lord. I believe God has put on my heart for you, uh, consistent with your theme, and it's in Hebrews and chapter six, verse twelve, where we read that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. That you may not be sluggish. The NIV translates it lazy. There's another verse that uses the same Greek word, and it says dull. that you may not become dull i think the time of being locked down our expectations can drop our ambition to inherit everything that god has for us can drop and we can kind of get dull in spirit and that's the last thing we want to be i don't want to be dull to you i don't want to become sluggish now in what ways can we be sluggish well i think first of all we can be sluggish mentally we don't bother to inquire about things i want to encourage you to read things that inspire you that motivate you get into books that really uh, get your heart moved and your mind involved i don't want to become sluggish in my mind 
I've been quite stimulated during the, the lockdown to write a book, which has meant I've given a lot of energies to researching and looking. It's kept my mind alert. And then again, our emotions. You know, we need emotional fulfillment. And if we don't find emotional fulfillment in God, one of the old Puritans says this, our souls will go in secret search to find emotional ful fulfillment somewhere else. Now the Bible says that Christ provides joy unspeakable and full of glory. In other words, you can have real highs in the presence of Jesus. If you don't have real highs with Jesus, you'll look for highs elsewhere. Otherwise you get dull. You get spiritually dull. Your anticipation of enjoying God and really being excited by him begins to wane and you drift. No, don't let your emotions grow dull. I loved singing to him in the morning, getting excited about what he's done for me. Enjoy him, enjoy his love. Emotionally don't get dull. And well then thirdly, in our willpower, we can become just lacking discipline. Now we know we're not legalists. Thank God the grace of God has set us free from legalism. We don't need legalism, but disciplines help us to fulfill our calling and so i do want to be disciplined i do want to make good choices i want to be disciplined with my use of time i don't want to find while we're locked in let's just watch netflix oh i'm late again oh i didn't get up in the morning no 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 i want to make some good disciplines so that i can meet with jesus learn of him if you don't make disciplines you you can kind of drift you don't you don't grow in god you become a sluggard. You know, it's interesting, a, a sluggard is an ordinary man who makes lots of bad choices. He's not a, a kind of different choice. In fact, it says this, the sluggard craves, but gets nothing. It's funny, I always thought a sluggard didn't want anything. But a sluggard craves, he wants, but he doesn't get, it says in Proverbs. Because why? Well, he doesn't make good choices. So we need to make good choices. Ed Cole says this, the popular notion that maturity comes with age. No, he says, you get old with age. Maturity comes with taking responsibility. Take responsibility for your life. I've seen some very immature old guys and I've seen some very mature young guys. Take good choices, take responsibility and so, yeah, in my mind, keep it thinking, alert. In my heart, expect emotional fulfillment. And in my will, my decision-making. So we don't grow sluggish. We don't grow dull. It'd be so sad if during this season we just start getting dull. We start missing our way. So what's the alternative? Am I saying, God, work harder, try harder? I'm not saying that. That's not what the verse says. We would be true to what the verse says. It says that we don't get sluggish, but through we, we imitate those who through faith and patience inherited the promises. All right, so the Bible gives us some tremendous examples of men and women who inherited what was promised them. And we're told to imitate them. Now, sometimes we think imitation, uh, it's just an imitation. But the word imitate is never used negatively in the New Testament. It's always positive and it's always present continuous. It's keep on imitating. So to imitate, you need to keep looking at, looking at some of the great heroes of the Old Testament that we can imitate their faith because they possessed what God promised them. They inherited what was promised. So it's not that we start working hard, it's that we are in danger. One of our greatest dangers is if we get sluggish, we drift away from the things we feel God has promised us. And that's some of the most precious things about you. God has made you promises. God's made me promises. There are Bible verses that maybe you underlined. I've seen people's Bibles where a verse underlined and a date written in the margin. It's like, God gave me this promise. And there are general promises to every believer about fruitfulness. You'll bear fruit, you'll glorify God. These are promises. We don't want to drift away from them. And so we need to imitate 
those who through faith and patience inherited. We often think that faith is kind of claim it now, but the Bible often puts together faith and patience to inherit. I often feel that Joseph was one of the most outstanding examples. You remember God made Joseph amazing promises. He had a dream that he would he would inherit, he would, he would govern, his brothers would bow down, he was going to have some kind of amazing future. And then life went so bad. You know, his brothers turned against him, he got sold down to Egypt. There he was lied against in Potiphar's household by his wife. Then he's in prison. It's like every step took him further away from the promises. But the wonderful thing is this, that he's in prison, far away from everyone he knows and loves and just in the terrible position. And then two other guys are thrown into the prison cell with him. And then one day they say, we had a dream. Both of them had dreams. And I think, I th they came to Joseph and we've had a dream. I think if I was Joseph, I think I would have said, eh, forget dreams. I used to have dreams, that's why I'm in prison. No, he said, tell me your dream. I think, well done, Joseph. You're still believing. You're still believing. And then that takes one more dream. When Pharaoh said, I've had a dream. And then Joseph's promises are absolutely fulfilled. He inherits what God promised him. He becomes prime minister of Egypt. All that God promised him happens. And then you get the same with David, where David is made promises. And it all seems to go wrong. And at first it looks great. You know, he takes out Goliath. He becomes a captain in Saul's army. And then Saul turns against him, starts throwing spears at him. Maybe you've had experiences like this. You think, well, I had hoped, I had thought, and everything's gone wrong. And one day he says to Jonathan, his dear friend, one day I'll die at the hands of Saul. And Jonathan comes back and says, no, no, you won't. You're going to be king. And, and you know, that's where we need one another. A dear brother who will believe with us. And that's one of the things we, if we're not careful, we can get cut off from fellowship through this shutdown time. But let's be in touch. Let's be on the phone. Let's, let's make contact. And let's stand with one another when maybe some, your brother's head's going down. You know, David, the great David, the great man after God's own heart. He said, ah, oh, I'm losing it. And Jonathan said, no, you're not. You're going to be king. And, and restores his faith. We need one another. We need one another. That's what God's made. The church is meant to be like that for one another. We're there for one another, to encourage one another, to bless one another, so that we don't let the promises slip. This is the important point about this verse, that God has made us promises and that we, through faith and patience, inherit. It says about Abraham, he grew strong in faith, fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. It says that in Romans 4, he grew in faith, giving praise to God, fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. If God's promised it, there's no reason why God won't perform it. He wouldn't make a promise he can't fulfill. And so Abraham let that certainty thrill his heart. And there's delay. You know, the story of Abraham, there's delay. But Romans 4 says, no, he grew strong in faith. It doesn't say he gradually lost out. He gradually lost his way. No, he grew strong in faith. He grew in faith, fully persuaded. If God said it, he's going to do it. He gave praise to God. So my beloved friends, let's keep praising him. Let's keep believing him. Let's not drift away from the promises. Let's gain them. Let's inherit everything God has for us. It's not that we just become like a slaves working hard, but we refuse to let go of what God's promised us. I love the story of Caleb, don't you? Caleb has to wait while a whole generation goes round in the wilderness. And at the end of that 40 years in the wilderness, he comes back to the promised land where they turned back. 
And he comes to Joshua and says, now give me this mountain that God promised me. He said, I feel as strong now as I was 40 years ago. I love that, don't you? He's still strong in faith. And he goes and takes the mountain. And then he, he, he kind of overflows for his daughter. You remember the story? How his daughter comes to him and says, she says, give us something of that and the springs of water. So his faith, his courage, kind of gets reproduced in the next generation. May God help us to be those who impart faith to the next generation so that we do press in and inherit what God has for us. I remember years ago I was leading the church in Brighton and we were on a, a big program of uh, um, buying a, a very large warehouse to become our meeting place and having bought it we had to do a lot of work on it and, and we had to raise a lot of money and we were having three gift days a year and, and we were asking God that we might raise £100,000 each gift day. We'd had our spring gift day, we raised 100000 we had our summer gift day, we raised 100,000. We had our autumn gift day and we raised 85,000. And I thought, well, praise God, you know, it's wonderful, 85,000 is great. So I announced to the church, well, you know, the offering was 85,000 and um, it was great. We had got 200,000 earlier in the year. And as I got alone with God afterwards, I felt God spoke to me and said, Oh, so that was okay, was it? And I thought, well, he said, so 85,000 is all right? I thought you wanted 100,000. Oh, but I did. But you seem to be content with 85,000. I thought, no, no, I'm not, I'm not. And I went after God again. I said, no, no, Lord, we do want 100,000. And sure enough, it came in. I was, I was going to let the promise get away from me. My dear brothers and sisters, as we press on through this very difficult season, Let's not grow dull. Let's not go sluggish. Let's imitate those who through faith and patience inherited. God be with you, my dear brothers and sisters, as you press forward. Let's inherit everything God has for us. Let's see churches planted all over India. Let's believe for health and strength, even for the next generation. God bless you as you press forward. Bye-bye for now.
Davino and I have known Sydney and Cheryl for a few decades now. Sydney is a lead elder in Living Word Church and also part of the apostolic team. And it's a privilege for us to introduce Sydney for this session. Hello, hello. Wow, everything online. It's been very strange indeed over these last seven months. Corona has indeed provoked us to consider God in the context of Darona, a Hindi word for don't fear. We all learned to Girona, not falling into the many traps and pits of depression and emotional stress. By learning to Padhona, a plea to soak in the truths of God's word leading us to Jiona, to live a life full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And even though you could not physically meet, you found ways to connect with God and encourage each other daily for many of us. And I want to commend every elder and church leader, every ministry leader, every small group leader for reaching out to bring love and hope to each of your members, the seniors, the youth, the couples, the ones stressed from losing jobs or pay cuts, you stood with them and continued reaching out to a paining world. Well done. Thank you, Vinu, for the opportunity to speak at this conference. I trust the Lord will bless and encourage each of you watching and challenge you too as we remind ourselves that we are together to see thousands of lives transformed through hundreds of churches in tens of nations. Having recently reached the 200 mark we set out to five years ago, we move on now to consider the impossible goal of a thousand churches over the next 10 years by 2030. More nations, people groups to reach, more areas to cover until there is no place left where Christ needs to be preached and lived out like Paul said. Is this possible? Will we reach? How does your church, wherever you are, work towards this vision? How can you personally be caught up? How can every one of our churches press on to take a hold of that for which Jesus has taken a hold of us? Which leads us to our passage for today. Let's read Philippians in chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take a hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it. The one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. I trust many of you have preached from this passage as you served your church. It is good to consider the context and hear scholars say, Paul is writing this letter from prison in Rome to the church in Philippi, the first church in Europe that he had established, when he along with Silas was answering the heavenly vision to go to Macedonia. He met and preached to Lydia, a seller of pur purple. She believed, received Paul and Silas into her home, and perhaps that was the beginning of a church there. This may have been your experience when you started a church, it surely was our experience with Cheryl and me when we went to Nasik six months after being married along with John and Molly Oldfield. We went to a group of people who had been gathering there. There was joy and fear as we began to gather and lead people to know and love Jesus. We learned for the first time what it means to face serious opposition and not from flesh and blood alone, but from powers and principalities. We remember our two-year-old daughter suddenly in pain. We remember the physical oppression of the demonic through horrifying dreams. We remember the strange difficulties in the life of the church. But we pressed on and today we rejoice to see a thriving church and many all over the city of Nasik. There were times we felt like just giving up and leaving the place. We're so glad we did not. His grace was sufficient and adequate. But many of you who have started churches and works would have faced and are facing difficult challenges too. 
But you too, please don't give up. For many of you, you may have grown up in church and never ventured into new territories to represent Jesus to a community who may have never heard his name or who today consider Christians a threat. You need to hear God and take some radical steps of faith and go plant a church or go to be with a church plant or just get out of your comfort zone and get into God's zone of an adventure together. You know, a church plant is very much like a startup company. Some work, some don't, and it's okay. We learn as we take steps of faith to see the kingdom of God cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. We're now in Mumbai and believe the Lord has called us to start a church site in every zone of Mumbai, a small group in every ward, but beyond to see a church in every state of our nation and one in every country of the world, along with our commissioned family of churches. Our local church will enjoy all the strength and support we can get from brothers and sisters who stand with us as a commission family of churches. Now back to Paul and Philippians. We notice as we consider the theme rising out of this passage to persevere, to keep on going, to keep taking the next step, to not stop moving on, to keep pressing on. Paul presents us with three obvious thoughts. Goals, forgetting, and persevering. Let's look at each of these thoughts and then find some particular application for us. Number one, goals. I like this quotation from a famous English sculptor, Henry Moore. He was asked a fascinating question. Now that you are 80, you must know the secret of life. What is it? Moore paused ever so slightly with just enough time to smile before answering. The secret of life, he mused, is to have a task. Something you do your entire life. Something you bring everything to, every minute of the day, for your whole life. And the most important thing is, it must be something you cannot possibly do. I love this quote, because he talks about a goal, but the goal is seemingly impossible. Without Christ, faith is so important. Trust in Jesus, believing the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is what makes life exciting and adventure. Now here in Philippians, we notice a particular goal Paul is referring to. Paul wrote many of the New Testament books, but writing New Testament books was not his main goal in life. Paul preached the gospel, but preaching the gospel was not his main goal in life, it seems. Paul established many churches, but establishing churches was not the main goal. So what was his goal? He'd been having the most amazing experiences and interactions with the Lord. Namely, he talks about having an out-of-body experience that he can't fully explain. Is that some knowing or what? He's spoken to dreams. God speaks to him, talk, calling him to places. Wow. He's moving in such power that his handkerchief is healing, healing people. Amazing. He has revelations of the Lord that we are still trying to figure out today. And he says he has not obtained all of this or that he has not arrived at his goal, but is persevering or pressing on. What is this goal? Paul's main goal in life was to know Jesus Christ. He presents us with his first primary goal presented to us in verses 10 and 11. And I like the New Living Translation here. I want to know Christ, to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead, pressing towards the goal. If knowing Christ was Paul's primary goal, should that not be the primary goal for each one of us too? I don't think I pursue knowledge and intimacy with Jesus like Paul. Nor in the way that Psalmist writes, my soul longs for the Lord as a deer pants for water. I wonder if you and me must give ourselves to this primary goal of knowing Jesus. You know, what if we reach the goal of a thousand churches and perhaps even cross it to 1500 or 2000 churches and the Lord returns I'm, and he may say to some of us, I don't know you because you had no time for me. 
You are busy teaching. You are busy preaching. You are busy evangelizing. You are busy casting out demons. You are busy prophesying. You are busy healing. You are busy giving to the poor and performing signs and wonders in my name. But I don't know you. Is knowing Christ a personal goal for you? No matter how old you are or how young you are, no matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, is Christ and getting to know him your personal goal? Now here in this text, Paul focuses on knowing Christ as a primary goal. But elsewhere, he encourages us about another goal. What about the goal of family? Do you have a goal for your family? The language used in Genesis in chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, says, This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. You know this thing about leaving parents, uniting physically, emotionally, spiritually with your spouse? is God's goal for your marriage. For many, many years, I thought that family, spouse, children, and extended family were very low on my list of priorities. How wrong I was. I hid behind the verse, in fact, a few verses, but Luke chapter 14 and 26, where I believed that I must not love my family with all my heart, mind, soul, and body, and that was only reserved for the Lord. I had painfully lost so much and learned a very difficult lesson. Is your family a goal at all? What do you dream of in your relationship with your family? Do you have a dream of your marriage? If you're just getting married or married a few years, I warn you, time will fly by soon. Before you know it, you'll be celebrating 30 years of wedding anniversary like me. And I wondered where all the years go by. We live in a day and age when marriage is devalued more and more. It will need to be a goal to show a mystery of Christ and the church, like it says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 32. The church is a family of families. Every family is important. Are you investing in helping marriages learn to be married? One expert said, marriages break not for lack of love, but from a lack of skill, how to be married. I urge you to make marriage and family life a goal. May I also say that perhaps singleness could be a goal too. What is your goal? What about a third goal for your church? Does your church have a goal, a vision that the Lord has called you to accomplish in your lifetime? I have a goal for our church, and perhaps it came not because I was looking. A few of our leaders constantly challenged me to know what's in the mind of God for our church. It took me three years to discover and then get on the journey. I believe that each church, every church, wherever you are, whether you're in a village, you're in a city, you're starting, or you've been there for many years, the Lord has given a specific that for which he has established you as a church. And it's often the lead leader in a team that God will choose to work through. Pray diligently for him and his team. God wanted to set people free from Egypt, so he chose a man, Moses. God wanted to bring people into the promised land, so he chose a man, Joshua. God wanted to create a family through whom all the world would be blessed, so he chose a man, Abraham. God specifically called Paul to the Gentiles, but he called Peter to the Jews. God called William Carey to India. He called Hudson Taylor to China. He recently called a man to the naked tribes of the Andaman who died there. Who has God called you to? Who has God called your church to? Does your church have a that for which you are a community and a church on a journey? May I present one more goal that I have set for myself in this period of great uncertainty? and lessons from our own New Frontiers history. A key goal that will keep our movement as it presses on into the 50th or 60th year of its existence. And the only way for it not to be completely dead is the fourth goal of unity in your local eldership 
or leadership teams. Psalm 133 talks about brothers dwelling in unity. It is from this unity that God commands a blessing flowing down the high priest's beard, falling on the mountains of Zion, the church. Paul to the Ephesians in chapter 4 and verse 3 begs them to make every effort to maintain the bond of unity. I want to warn you, it will take every effort. It will need perseverance. I would suggest that this unity is so precious for a few reasons. I'm the dominating type, strong. I want my will to be done. I think I'm always right. And I see what others most often cannot see. I want to do quickly what can be done and should be done. And I'm impatient to wait for others to see it. Or often, I feel that only I can see it. Basically, I am independent. And I want to be a self-made man. And I want to lead the best church. And I want to do it by myself. But God works as a team. In prayer, are you not often confused to pray to the Father or the Son? What about asking the Holy Spirit for help or Jesus? I think he's deliberately modeling teamwork. Paul encourages elders to be set in every church. Work as a team, never alone. For us, working as a team will keep me from leading into heresy or false doctrine. It will keep me from becoming too big for my boots. It will temper me from rash and impulsive decisions. Make the goal of unity in marriage and in your leadership team a priority. Moving on to the second, forgetting. As Paul clearly defines his goals, he also seems to define what he must leave behind. Paul has had some amazing achievements and some very devastating, painful experiences too. And I believe he is here encouraging us to forget all of that, the good, the bad, and the ugly. As a leader or a person following Christ, you are in the most vulnerable spot for two things. Pride. It is easier to handle failure than success. James and Peter remind us that God opposes the proud. I have prayed and meditated long and hard and recognized that I am proud. There's no way of escape for me. I believe that I'm the best and that no one is better than me. I've learned that when I use the words better than or feel that I was lesser than, it is pride. God loves me, not because of what I do or how well I do or don't do. His love for me never changes. Are you aware of the pride that lurks around? And what are you doing to guard against pride? What about unforgiveness? As a leader, you and me are in a position to have caused the most pain to people even if you've been leading for a few years in any ministry or even you've been a Christian for a few years and sadly, you have received the most pain too from people. Thoughts will often come flooding back of how you needed to have been treated and how you should have been spoken to better and in leading, you will have hurt people the most too. Many will feel you didn't hear them or heed them or to do what they were telling you to do. And you and me must have a clean heart towards every single person. There must not be one person in your life that you are not reconciled to. Whether it is your fault or their fault, starting from your blood brothers and sisters to uncles and aunties, to neighbors and friends, to colleagues and acquaintances, and then your relationships in church. Paul encourages the church in Rome in chapter 12 and verse 18. As far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Everyone. As far as it depends upon you, and a lot depends upon you and me. We may know that it is the right thing to do, and we must persevere to forgive everyone unilaterally. May I also sadly say to every spouse, every child, and every parent here, that as your spouse or parent or child is hurt and pained, you too must struggle to forgive everyone. You make the extra effort to be reconciled. And now persevering. I want to talk about persevering in the context of these goals. Persevere in knowing Christ. Persevere in prioritizing your spouse and family. Persevere in the that for your life and that for the church. Persevere in unity of church leadership. 
It is great to have a goal, but if you have no steps towards that goal, you cannot persevere. Persevere means deciding to suffer, deciding to endure, deciding to bear up, deciding to fix your eyes on Jesus and keep taking that next step. Persevering in the face of discouragement, persevering in the face of distraction, temptation, persevering in the face of tiredness, even disillusionment. May I make a few practical suggestions to persevere if you and me want to reach our goals? A daily time with God. Through prayer, talking honestly, casting your burdens on Him who cares for you. Bible meditation. Not just reading, actually thinking, considering it. Learning about Jesus in a new way and enjoying Him. Journalizing and studying are also steps to go deeper. Are you studying? Not to preach or to share, but to know God more. I've registered for courses online and been plodding along and been amazed with Jesus. I'm remembering Bonnie, a Nigerian friend of us, who was with our church for a season and he made a famous saying, no Bible, no breakfast. For some of us, it is morning, like Jesus, or night. For some of us, it is afternoon, like Peter on the roof. But there is a fixed appointment with your heavenly Father and it is really up to each of us to remain in Christ and he promises to remain in you. You never know when he'll give you a vision in the day like Peter or send an angel to comfort you. You will never know the difference of being with Christ. Others will, as Moses and the people experienced when he came down from the mountain with God. Second point, a weekly marriage time. My wife has been longing for this marriage time for the first 15 years of our marriage but our relationship was never a goal to me. It was never a priority. You know, strangely, marriage was a goal. But she was not. I taught passionately, consistently about marriage. I studied and tried to practice all the ways of marriage. But recently a speaker put it so sharply for me, it was like a slap. He said, we can learn all the ways of being a husband. We can love being a husband. We can come to such a state where we feel we are so good at being a husband, we don't need a wife. Wow! I did all the husband things and did not emotionally love my wife. I'm on a new learning journey. Brother, sister, I hope you too will be on that journey. Number three, a weekly leadership time. Unity in your leadership takes time. Oneness, honesty, trusting, resolving, vulnerability. Reconciling, debating, working towards, hearing, listening, sharing. All takes time to come to a unity of spirit. Don't give up till you reach a unity of spirit. Keep pressing on till you reach a unity of spirit. Church splits don't just happen. People don't suddenly leave you. Key leaders in your core team don't suddenly become difficult. Church history is littered with churches splitting or key men and women with great heart and passion for God just stopping to function. Make every effort. Meeting weekly, maintaining the bond of peace. Ask the ones overseeing you to come in to talk and help you and your team. In conclusion, may I urge you and beg you along with Paul to persevere in knowing Christ. To persevere in prioritizing your spouse and family. Persevere in unity of church leadership. As we persevere to see 1,000 churches by 2030 and more, never lose sight of Jesus, your family, and your core leadership team. May I end with a story. The year was 1968. The place, Mexico City. The closing ceremony of the Mexico City Olympic Games had just finished. The spectators were picking up their belongings and preparing to leave the Olympic Stadium when the PA announced rather to uh, ask them to remain in their seats. Outside the stadium, the sound of police sirens could be heard and the flash of blue lights kept encircling everyone, somebody making his way towards the stadium. The man was John Stephen Aquari, the marathon runner from Tanzania, Africa. The last marathon runner had entered the Olympic Stadium hours earlier before the closing ceremony even began. 
The medals had already been awarded. Why was John Stephen Akari so late? As Akari entered the stadium, the confused spectators soon realized he was covered with blood. He had taken a terrible fall early in the race, whacked his head on the pavement, severely damaged his knee, and endured a trampling by other runners before he could get back on his feet. The crowd rose to their feet and began cheering on the injured runner as though he was the marathon champion. When John Stephen Akari crossed the finish line, the crowd let out a thunderous roar. Akari was quickly whisked off to a nearby hospital to be treated for his injuries and the severe dehydration. The next day, Akwari was interviewed by a sports journalist. The first question the journalist asked, why, after sustaining such kinds of injuries, did you, would you ever get up and proceed to finish the race, finish the line? There was no way you could possibly win the race. John Stephen Akari said, my country did not send me 11,000 kilometers to start a race, but to finish one. Christ has not called you and me to start the race. He's called us to finish it. And so this is one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me, straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Christ Jesus has called me heavenwards. Amen. Amen. Oh, 
Jesus For he has said that he will bring me home And day by day I know he will bring me home Until I stand with joy before Wow, what a word. Sydney, thank you so much for those practical application to a to a message of persevering. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. What a great day we had. Great first day we had. And I'm I'm telling you that you know the next two days is going to be even more exciting. What do you say, Julie? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, we are we are really believing God for a superb conference. So, thank you so much for joining. I'm just going to pray and then we'll say bye to you. Father, we thank you for giving us a wonderful day. Thank you for all that you have enabled us to enjoy here and help us to really grow in those things that you taught us today. Bless all the people who gather today and for for the next two days we pray that a lot more people will join us and be blessed thank you lord in jesus name have a wonderful Amen. evening yeah and a great night god bless you thank you see you all tomorrow but please do invite your friends so that they may also enjoy their time together with us great thank you bye bye bye